So please welcome to the first talk of this afternoon. Um, our guest, which actually is the first international guest for Ensamer Camp today, uh, he works at building a vehicle system at a company called Faraday Feature. Uh, he studied at electronic engineering at Washington University, Waterloo University, and during your master you worked with the university, right? Yep. And uh, uh, you worked uh, for Tesla Motors, and Welcome. you are a contributor for Akaday.com. <laughs> so please welcome Eric Avenchik. <laughs> Thank you. I don't work at Faraday Future anymore, but Google that company if you want to read about a very strange automotive company. Um, anyway, today uh, I'm here talking about Cantact, open source tools for automotive. Um, it's something I've been working on for the last couple of years now and uh, just trying to share it with the community so people can play with cars. So a little bit about me, I redid the bio, but yeah, I'm from Canada, I live in Toronto. Uh, I did this stuff at the University of Waterloo where we built a hydrogen electric vehicle and a ethanol electric vehicle, both hybrids. Uh, thank you GM who gave us the car and the fuel cell and all the money and let us just like have fun, which is pretty fun. Uh, so yeah, University of Waterloo, that was the University of Waterloo alternative fuels team. And then I ended up doing a lot of work for GM through other people. Ended up at Tesla Motors for a little while and now I live in Toronto, which looks sort of like that. Uh, but the main theme here is uh, cars and, well, how they're intersecting with technology. So the issue is cars are computers. Um, they're becoming more and more like computers. The reasons are numerous, but really safety was the first one. So some of the first uh, really complex computerized systems you saw in vehicles were airbag modules. These were like giant modules originally, and now they are these tiny boxes. But that allows the vehicle to stop faster. Airbags are highly computerized. They're doing calculations all the time to determine if there is a deployment, how hard the airbag should fire, and uh, amongst other things. Uh, then you have advanced features. This has gotten a lot of press recently. These are things in the industry called uh, ADAS features, Advanced uh, Driver Assistance Systems. So that's, uh, the automotive industry loves acronyms, so you just have to get used to a bunch of letters and figuring out what they are. But those are systems that are like the lane keep assist, uh, active radar so that your vehicle follows another vehicle perfectly. Uh, the Tesla autopilot system is an example of this. There's many other automotive companies working on it. And obviously now where the new talk is all about self-driving where you'll have fully autonomous vehicles. Uh, but actually probably the biggest reason that cars became like computers has to do with emissions. Engines started getting way more complex as regulations came in that required emissions to be lower. So suddenly you can't just have a nice like carburetor that's on an engine and fires because that you know isn't terribly efficient. So you start looking at fuel injection, you start doing things like exhaust gas recirculation, variable valve timing, all of this. And uh, those are pretty complex. You need some, uh, some computer features. So that's why they're getting computerized. But all of these systems, they're all discrete and they all kind of sit around your car somewhere and they need to talk to each other. And that's why cars have become networks. A modern vehicle uh, is up to sometimes more than 100 electronic control units in it. This is everything from like the seat controller that moves your seat back and forth to the door controller that makes your windows go up and down, the engine, uh, maybe an emergency call controller, uh, power steering, like the list goes on and on and on. This is like a very simplified diagram of what a car's network might look like. And that internal network is very trusted and we'll get into why it's end ended up being trusted in a minute. But the other thing is that, ooh. Oh, we have an hourglass. Come on. There we go. I need to not touch my laptop at all. Uh, cars are now on the internet, and oh, this is fun. Uh, so yeah, it started in 1996 when GM launched OnStar, which was sort of the first connected feature. Uh, and now 
there's apps in many vehicles. And in 2018, every car sold here in the EU is going to have to have emergency call features. That means it has a cellular modem. It's going to have data and voice. So it doesn't matter what car you buy, if it's newer than 2018 in the EU, it will have a SIM card. Um, so yeah, there are networks, there's computers. Uh, why are these vulnerable? Well, one thing that you need to look at in a vehicle is just how complex they are. Uh, we're talking millions and millions of lines of code. We're talking networks that are just inherently trusted. So like, it's pretty much perfect for a system to be abused. It's, it's got all the characteristics you'd like. And one thing that I find funny, this doesn't show up very well, but this is actually showing the open source licenses that you see in it was a modern Mercedes vehicle. Um, the lib PCAP license is on there. Uh, there's a netcat license. So literally your car is running like everything you need to hack the car. Uh, it's like ready to go. Um, but there is a huge amount of open source software. No one never, or no one ever really looks at which versions are which. The only way you can tell is by looking at the disclosures that they're legally required to do by the GPL. And then you also have like the bragging that happens. Uh, so this is an actual ad for Mercedes E-Class. And it says, you know, the masterpiece of intelligence with 50 times more code than a Raptor jet or fighter jet <laughs> and 250 times more code. And then it says the primary flight computer in NASA's space shuttle, which is one way to brag about how good your engineering is. But I mean, if you work in security, you've probably seen that more complexity typically leads to more problems. So... Yeah, automotive security became a thing because you have these really complex, vulnerable systems, so let's hack them. And the current state when this all started was pretty bad because really vehicles were just, it was also security by obscurity. Uh, they have these internal networks, which we'll talk about, and one of these is the CAN bus. And accessing that was considered kind of hard in the sense that no one did it. Um, researchers, security researchers, didn't know much about these protocols. Um, and then they learned. The other thing is, things started to get more kind of IP-based. So we started seeing, you know, SIM cards. We started seeing apps that can control your vehicle. And then uh, a lot of bad things happened. Um, the brief history of this is 1991 is when it really starts. This is more of a U.S. history, but bear with me. Uh, the California Air Resources Board that introduced this requirement for OBD, which is onboard diagnostics. If you own a car made after 1991 in the U.S., and base, I don't know what year it was here, but basically every car has this port. You can plug into it, and you'll get some data out of the vehicle. And that became required in 1996. Uh, in 2008, CAN became a requirement in the U.S., so basically everyone used CAN. Uh, in 2010, the uh, CAESS, which was a joint research between two U.S. universities, uh, they teamed up and did this awesome hack of a... I can't say which vehicle still, because there was some disclosure problems, but they, they hacked a car and like found all this awesome like over-the-air attacks where they could shut the car off and all this. Then in 2015, the one that you may have heard a lot about recently was uh, that... Uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, they launched, the, well, they did their whole demo at Black Hat showing, hey, we can over the air, you know, attack this stock car. And then the other interesting one that people didn't hear about as much in 2015 was that finally, after like three years of fighting it out in the courts, the guys who did the research on the Megamos uh, encryption, which is used by Volkswagen Group to protect their keys, so protecting starting the vehicle and entry of the vehicle, Finally, they were able to release most of what they found, which was really damning, like really bad crypto. Um, and this brings us sort of to today. It's, you know, it's in the news a lot. Uh, you know, let's kill the Jeep on the highway. And uh, also another fun one was you could use the app for the uh, Nissan Leaf, which is an electric vehicle. And you could, you know, turn on the HVAC and do a few different things to the car. For authentication, it just required the VIN number, which is the number that's printed on the front plate of the car. Uh, probably not the best password. <laughs> and using that, you could actually kind of kill the battery of the car, and then someone would have to get it towed. So like, someone figured this out before people started trolling people by, by doing that, thankfully. But uh, that's sort of the history. But let's get into the network. So what is CAN? It stands for Controller Area Network. 
And it's a bunch of low-cost uh, integrated controllers. So what this means is you can buy a microcontroller for like a dollar, and it might, if you buy the right one, have a CAN peripheral on it. So there's no like, uh, you know, Phi and Mac, like Ethernet. There's a transceiver, which is also really cheap. It's just, it's super cheap to do, and that's the main reason that this popped up. There's a few different types. You have the typical high-speed CAN, which is a differential uh, signaling, so it's kind of like RS-485 or Ethernet. Uh, you have a twisted pair of wires, and it does noise rejection. Uh, then moving down, you have the uh, low-speed CAN, which is on a single wire. It's just cheaper, and that's about all there is to say about it. You have fault-tolerant CAN, which is really cool because it's the dual-wire one, but if you cut one of the wires, it becomes the single-wire one. This is used for like airbags and nothing else. Uh, and there's also this new CAN-FD, which lets you make bigger payloads, which we'll talk about. And a typical network will look something like this, except with a lot more nodes. Um, you'll have like an engine control module, body control, transmission control, anti-lock brake control, maybe. They're all on one CAN bus, and that's a differential high-speed bus. Then someone, in this case the body control module, which is pretty typical, it acts as a gateway. So that guy is going to send messages back and forth between these two different CAN buses. And on this, you have like the door control modules, you have an instrument panel for the speed and everything. And uh, yeah, that's really all there is to a CAN bus with a lot more nodes. And as you can see, like this body control module, it's kind of like a... Well, it's like a gateway in the, you know, the normal IT world. It's taking in messages and passing them on, depending on what they are. So the way that it can actually works, there's really just a few terms you need to know. A bus is like the collection of all these controllers. It's the actual physical wiring. They're just all on a bus. A frame is one single, we'll say, can packet, so one kind of atomic can message. And it has three things that you probably care about. The identifier, which just is a number from 0 to hex 7FF, oh, sorry, uh, 7, yeah, sorry, 7FF for the standard frames. And that tells you what this message means. There's a data length code, which just says how many bytes of data are there. And then there's 8 bytes of data, and that's it. This is kind of interesting when you compare it to Ethernet. There's no, like, source MAC address or destination MAC address. It's just this one identifier, and that leads to some, some security problems that are pretty evident. But just to look at how it works, you typically have something called a signal database. And this is programmed like, at, you know, when they design the car, they design a signal database. It's programmed right into the firmware. And that's how when you send a message, the guy on the other end knows what that means. So in this case, engine control module is sending eight bytes of made up data with the ID of OX123. So if we stick some data in there, uh, these first two bytes, the signal database is what will tell you if you look at ID OX123 on this bus and you look at bytes 1 and 2, those come out to be the engine RPM. And it can do some fancier things like tell you to multiply or add or subtract, but that's really all it is. You just look at some bytes and that's a number and you're done. Now the instrument cluster can display it. That's like 90% of what your car does. Just, it literally is, is this. There's just messages flying around all the time. They're periodic. That's all. Diagnostics is the other thing. This is done when you bring your car in for service or when you play with it yourself. Um, you take a client, which is a scan tool. So this is the expensive thing your mechanic has that plugs in. You plug that in, and it's going to make a request. The protocol used for this, there's two really in cars. OBD is the open standard that you'll find all the information about on Wikipedia. Um, and UDS is the less open standard that the automakers use for their proprietary features. So things like, uh, well, one of the demos that was done was activating the brakes on a car. That was actually through a diagnostic request that's meant for the mechanic to be able to tell the car apply the brakes because I'm trying to bl uh, bleed out the air from the brake system. So that's one example of a diagnostic request that if you use it when the car is moving, it doesn't go very well. Um, so OBD is that uh, standard. It's honestly, the Wikipedia page for it is probably the best resource. <laughs> it was meant for smog testing. And it provides really easy access to the vehicle network because there's a connector that looks like that in basically every car. And if you plug into it, you usually get a CAN bus on a modern vehicle. 
Uh, some older cars use simpler protocols, but usually it's CAN. If you're on certain vehicles, that's the CAN bus that the engine and everyone else is also on, and you're just sitting on there too, which is great. Other vehicles are a little bit more secure. They like gateway things to prevent you from just sending whatever you would like, but there's ways around that. Also for OBD, there's cheap, cheap tools and they're really useful. You can go on eBay and buy these dongles that are like probably 10 euro. Um, they are Bluetooth for the most part and they let you do your own diagnostics, but only for the really simple OBD2 stuff. They're still kind of fun to play with. Um, just quickly getting into the tools. So this is kind of what I've been focusing on is the tool side. And the reason is because a lot of them are very expensive. Um, Vector is the big name. Uh, it's a German company. They make like all the stuff that the actual automakers use. As a result, if you would like one of their tools, you're looking to shell out usually like, you know, five figures in U.S. dollars, which is not something I'm going to do. Um, going down the list, you have some companies like Cavasser who make cheaper options, but they're still like in the thousands, so still. Eh. Then there's the Pecan Grid Connect tool. That one's actually pretty good. It's only 250 bucks, but it's closed source. Their API is, leaves something to be desired. And the software that comes for free is really limited. Like, you can see some messages and send some messages, and that's it. And for the full software, it's like 600 bucks plus you want the add-ons, and it ends up being thousands of dollars. Uh, the Ecom cable was one that got a lot of uh, popularity with some, some of the car hacking folks. It's still expensive. You want their software, and it's still closed source. And, blah, blah. and uh, then you have these Elm 327 dongles, which are pretty cool. They're the, the ones I was talking about, little Bluetooth OBD tools. Uh, they're really cheap, but they're also really limited in what they can do. They only really do diagnostics, and that's, that's it. So what happened was I was like, I want an open source one. And I looked at my options, and there was like three. Uh, Good Thopter is uh, made by a guy named Andrew Ryder. It was a based on the uh, Good Fet by Travis Goodspeed. It's cool. The only problem is you can't really buy it. You would have to build it yourself. The Canvas Triple is something that you could buy. I think you can still buy it. And it's like three CAN buses with an Arduino-based uh, programming environment, which is kind of neat. And it's sort of meant for being installed in a car and like you implementing your own features, which is not quite what I wanted. I wanted to be able to you know, mess around with the CAN bus. Uh, on the software side, there was actually some good stuff, though. We have a Socket CAN on Linux, which if you have a modern Linux distro installed, it may well support CAN bus, which is kind of neat. You can literally go IF config CAN zero up, and it will bring up a CAN interface. The only problem is your computer doesn't talk CAN, so we need something in between. Wireshark also has support for CAN, which is something you may have like accidentally found if you typed CAN into the filter list and like all this stuff came up. But other than that, most people don't know, even though they use Wireshark a lot. So I came up with this CAN tag thing back in last year. Uh, launch the hardware for that. And basically what it is, uh, really should have taken one out of here before I started, but basically what it is, it's a little device where you have CAN bus on one side. Uh, if I don't have one on me, I'm going to look really bad. There we go. Uh, CAN bus on one side, on a DB9, USB on the other, that's it. And you plug this in, Linux, Mac, OS, or Linux, uh, Mac, Windows, it works. And it worked all right. Uh, the only issue was the software. It was really Linux had socket can. Windows and OS X, the device worked, but there was no software for it. So you could like watch in like putty or something, the can messages fly by, but that's not really useful. Uh, so in 2016, it was mostly software and launching new, new tools. And now moving forward, it's like, okay, more software, because once you have access to the bus, it suddenly just becomes a software problem. Um, so the hardware, if you're interested in hardware, this thing, it's single channel, high speed USB. It doesn't do single wire yet. Um, and it uses a virtual serial port. I got a lot of people saying, oh, well, that can only go at, uh, what is it, 115, 200 bits per second. Uh, it turns out, no, there's a sweet hack you can do, because the virtual serial port just looks like one USB endpoint, and you can hammer data into it pretty quickly. So, yeah, worked. 
uh, and it's based on uh, the STM32 F0, which is made by ST. It's like the perfect microcontroller for the job because it has CAN and USB and is cheap. Whereas every other microcontroller that has CAN and USB is meant to be like in an infotainment unit in a car and costs like 50 bucks. Um, it's jumper selectable for the pinout because there's a few different p uh, DB9 pinouts CAN uses, which is annoying, but the easiest way around it was just to make it so you can assign jumpers. And uh, it's open source. You can go online and you can get the KiCad files, so it's all open source tools as well. You can get the Gerbers from there, and then you can actually build it yourself, or you can buy one if you so care to. It looks like that if you're not sitting right here. Um, but the new stuff was the can the software, so I've talked about the hardware a bunch. Um, and really my problems were, again, commercial, expensive, Windows only, and you're stuck with whatever you get, typically. The open source stuff, Linux only, which is not a problem for people in this room, maybe, but it turns out if you want, like, a lot of people to use your product, it has to support Windows. Uh, it's kind of hard to use. You have to, like, know what commands to run. And there's limited graphical tools. It's, you know, you can get nice dumps into a terminal, but eh, that's not everyone's cup of tea. So I wanted a lot of things. Uh, I wanted to be cross-platform, uh, easy-to-use graphical user interface. I want to be able to do that raw can stuff, just the messages that are always flying around, as well as the diagnostics, the uh, request and response. And I want it to be easy to extend so you can hack it. Hardware agnostic, so like if you have one of these, great. If you build your own thing and you want to make it work with that, then cool, go do that. I don't care. Uh, or if there's a better tool that comes out, like make it work with that. And also a focus on reverse engineering because that's what I tend to do with these systems is look at all that data and go, what do these signals mean? So I made some decisions on designing it, uh, which was Java 8 plus NetBeans. And it directly accesses the, the device. It doesn't use socket can or anything. And it's open source, so you can play with it. But, um, oh, yeah, so Java, uh, this is the meme that really represents my feelings on using Java, which is, I thought I had a problem, so use Java, now I have a problem factory. And uh, Java's getting better, though. This is the Google Trends for Java sucks over time. So clearly, <laughs> we're getting there. But uh, it leaves some stuff to be desired. But the real purpose was, hey, let's build a tool and like do some things in it to see what's useful and what, what, you know, what we need. So what do we need? Trace view. This is like the ba most basic thing. You plug it in, and all the frames on that bus are sequentially just shot into this window. And one of the Java issues is that in doing that, <laughs> this uses a lot of CPU. But it does work on this laptop, at least. Uh, and what you'll do is you'll get all this data, and you'll look at it. You can log it. You can play it back. But you know it's kind of hard to read these as they're flying by a 1,000 messages a second. So there's this live view. And this thing, kind of hard to see on this screen, Every row of this view represents one CAN ID. So in that message before, it was like ID 123, and there was an engine RPM. What this will do is it'll just keep that ID on the same line, and when data changes, it will boop, highlight in red what changed. And this is actually like the go-to how you reverse engineer, well, a lot of systems, but CAN buses. You basically just watch. So you, you know, run the software, you sit there with the car, you bring the engine RPM up, and you see what changes. And as you see the rates that things are changing at, you can kind of infer, hey, this looks like it's tied to maybe the pedal position, or RPM, or vehicle speed, or whatever it is, and then you can work back and figure out what those are. And this is the technique you use to do that. It seems very I don't know, simple, and it is, but it works, so that's, that's how we do it. Now, that's really good for your live, the data that's always on the bus. For diagnostics, there's this ISOTP, which is really just a ISO standard with another acronym because it's the ISO. And if you buy their like 200 Swiss francs or whatever the currency is, PDF that, the, that you need for this, it tells you how you can take these CAN frames that are only 8 bytes and then jam a bunch of them together to be longer than 8 bytes up to 4,095 bytes. And all this does is do that decode for you. So if you need to send one of these longer than 8-byte standardized things, you can do it. 
which is useful to me developing the software and almost nobody else. So there's a diagnostics window which implements the actual UDS services. Didn't get too much into how UDS works, but uh, basically it defines this whole list of services. And those are things like read data by identifier, write data by identifier. Then you get more interesting ones like read data by memory and write data by memory address, which is cool. Not enabled on most controllers for good reason. You have security access, which is a very basic way of securing the ECU, and there's like an exchange that happens to unlock it. And uh, you also have things like firmware download and firmware upload, which are obviously pretty interesting from the security point of view, because there are controllers where once they're unlocked, you can just throw some bytes into it, and that flashes it. Uh, so the diagnostics window here, all of those different services have different parameters that are formatted differently. It's a giant pain. This aims to make it easy. It implements a few of the services that are most common. So for security access, for example, you select that service. You say, I want security level one. There's a security access data record, which is part of the standard, which you can enter. You hit request seed, and it will come back with a response. And then you then need to send a key. So you enter the key in here and hit send key. Uh, and if you know what the algorithm is to unlock it, you just do that device unlocks. So the idea of this is rather than having to like fiddle with the protocols yourself, you can just use a GUI and punch in the numbers and it works, which is especially nice for doing things like scanning for all of the different identifiers that are supported. So you can just try to read every from zero to FFFF, all of them and see what you get back. Or you can try to read every mem the entire memory of a device. Uh, some devices have been known to put secrets that really shouldn't be known in memory that was readable over that command. So this key, which is supposed to be a secret, if you just kind of issued the right read memory by address command, you would get the memory address containing the secret. And if you knew it was there, you could just grab it. Uh, and in that case, you could then potentially disable the immobilizer and drive the car away. So that's kind of a secret you don't want getting out there. So the diagnostics are a very interesting uh, perspective, both from the hacker side of like, I want to know more about systems and I want to like do stuff with them because you can fix your own car if you know how to do diagnostics. It's also interesting from the security perspective because these are protocols that were never really meant to be touched by anything but the official tool. And if you're not the official tool, you can, I mean, any time that you see that in security where they just assume no one else will touch it, it usually doesn't end well. Uh, and this is a perfect example of that. So diagnostics, super fun. Um, so the other thing here is the, the scripting side. So it does JavaScript-based scripting right now, which works. And uh, it gives you two callback functions, basically. And when it receives either a can frame or an entire one of those longer payloads, it will call it and give you the data. And then you can transmit, or you can log it, or do whatever you'd like. One example of this uh, that we've done is for extracting security keys through a different means, which is really archaic, but works. The unlock, I don't have a good picture of it in this set of slides, but uh, the unlock for vehicle or, uh, the security access is very simple. There's this thing that you send requesting a what's called seed. It's supposed to be a random number. It gives you that random number back, and then you use that to generate what they call a key, which is a strange name, but really it's a challenge and a response. All it is. Here's the problem. Usually the challenge is a fixed number. The reason for this is they don't want to put the algorithm for generating that challenge into your car because they use that same algorithm everywhere. So if they put it in your car and you get it, that could be bad. That was the idea. Um, then you have the uh, other problem, which is the challenge and the response are both only two bytes long. So you can just brute force it in a relatively short period of time, like maybe a couple days if it's implemented all of the timeouts correctly. So if it stops you from, you know, it'll only let you try five times and it will lock it. But then you can just reset the controller and try again or power the controller off and get on again and try it again. So you can script some of this and just say, all right, uh, give me your static, uh, your static challenge, and here is the response of zero. Now here's the response of one, and let's keep going until I figure out what the valid number is. But I know it's between zero and FFFF, which is not that big of a key space. 
So that's a, a lot of the scripting on this is you can automate these, you can write tools to uh, look at packets and do other kinds of analysis to aid reverse engineering, and uh, really whatever people come up with. It's <laughs> it just leaves it open-ended. So as for what's next on this tool, um, I did kind of ba bash Java really badly in the earlier slides. Considering moving it to C++ and Qt, but I haven't figured out if that's like less or more evil yet. Uh, it is better on performance. So if anyone has any like strong opinions on Java versus Qt or Qt, then you let, let me know because uh, that's sort of a decision that's in the works. Um, I'm able to do more protocols. So I talked about unified diagnostic services, which is cool. But uh, there's also this thing called CanOpen that exists in the world of industrial automation, and uh, there's also a few other weird CAN protocols like Modbus over CAN. It'd be nice to support those. Um, the databases I talked about, that whole lookup of these bytes mean this. Right now, there's no support for that. There is a kind of quasi-unofficial standard in the automotive industry called DBC files. You can find some of these on sites like opengarages.org, and they actually are a file that tells you what all the stuff means. Sometimes they leak out of companies and sometimes people reverse engineer them. So it would be nice to support those. So you can just plug in and instead of seeing a bunch of bytes, you can actually see, oh, engine RPM is this and uh, vehicle speed is this, GPS coordinates, all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, more. I, you can just keep going with this stuff. It's, there's tons of features packed into vehicles and you could write different tools to kind of attack or analyze every different little piece if you wanted to. Um, a fun bonus, if anyone's into Golang here, uh, I, I'm kind of a fan. Uh, you can do it from uh, with Cantac. So Go can drive a Cantac device on all platforms. I wish Go supported better graphical user interfaces, or else I'd be using this for everything. But basically, it's quite simple to create a device, set the bit rate to mode 6, which is 500 kilobits per second, open the connection to the bus, and then I want to send a frame. I just create some data bytes, then I create a frame, which is the ID, the data length, and the data, and I write the frame. Then I want to read a frame back, so I just, you know, hit read frame, which is a blocking call, and then print out the frame. So this is just like sends a frame and receives one frame, which is not that exciting. But what is awesome with Go is it has concurrency features where you can just like stick this into a Go routine, and it will like sit over there and just collect frames for you in the background. and works very nicely. So if you want to play with this in Go, you can. Um, quick mention of what's emerging in the automotive world. I've been talking about CAN for like too long now. <laughs> um, started doing this stuff back in like university, like I said, and started like went to my first security conference talking about OBD and things like in 2012, and I'm still doing it because it hasn't changed much. But it's starting to change a little bit. Um, Crypto can or MACT can or whatever you want to call it is basically applying cryptography to the CAN bus. This has a lot of challenges, namely that these are real time systems that need to know data like reliably every hundred milliseconds on the dot. And adding a delay to do crypto is not necessarily something that you would like to do. Now, of course, you say, well, that's fine. Let's just throw more processing power so we can get a delay that's small enough. The other thing about this is, unlike your laptop where you bought it and you paid for the hardware and someone else is going to run software and they don't really care about how, many, how much resources you have, in the automotive world, if I want to add more uh, computationally intense functions, I have to add cost to the vehicle because that's a more expensive processor, it probably is more software, it might be more power and then I need to redesign, you know, uh, the PMIC and things like that. So it gets really expensive to do some of this. And the other problem is it's not very clear that it would help much. Uh, doing a denial of service attack on a CAN bus is literally just a matter of sending frames fast. If you're connected in any way, you can take the whole bus down. So this protects against forged data. It doesn't really protect against uh, other classes of attacks. Then the other problem that you have is uh, it's really hard to do this in a supply chain. So one thing people forget about automotive is it's not like Mercedes-Benz makes your car and every part in it. 
everything is made by somebody else. So like someone might make a controller, someone else writes the software for it, and then someone else puts it together, and then finally Mercedes gets it and slaps it in a car. And it's really hard to do things like secret distribution through those supply chains and make sure they line up because you don't necessarily know which controller is going to end up in which car. So you need to start putting in fancier features, like it needs to be able to learn the keys, or it needs to be able to uh, assign the keys at runtime, whatever it is. And that also gets more complicated, which makes it more likely to be vulnerable. So it's this whole, it's cool, and some people are trying to do it. It's not easy. Uh, can FD I talked about a bit. So 8 bytes in normal CAN. CAN FD gives you 64 bytes of data. This helps because another challenge I didn't mention about encrypting CAN is when you have 8 bytes, I mean, how much can you really do? If you have like 4 bytes of data and f a 32-bit Mac, that's... Well, and you also need a counter, so now you're down to... You just run out of bytes is basically what it is. Most of the implementations right now use a single byte counter, and that counter rolls over every like couple seconds, maybe. So it's eh, not ideal. Um, can FD 64 bytes, so you can do more with that space. Uh, automotive Ethernet is this thing that everyone's getting excited about, and some people think it's going to make cars more secure. Uh, I think it's a little scary because putting IP in anything has never made it more secure in the history of the world. Uh, <laughs> But the reason it's happening is because the IEEE specified, actually uh, Broadcom developed it, and then the IEEE standardized it. This thing called 100 base T, which you've heard of, one with a one at the end. Um, it's also called Broad R Reach because Broad or Broadcom wanted to put their own special name on it. What this is is 100 megabit Ethernet over a single twisted pair of cheap wire. So no shielding is needed. No RJ45 connectors. It Physically, it's the same wiring as differential can, but it goes 100 times faster, which is nice. Um, of course, the issue with this is it is IP. So you're talking about, and I've read some of the standards for the diagnostic interfaces, and it's like, you must have two TCP listeners and one UDP listener that listen for this, and there's all these weird states that happen. Like, it's not a simple protocol that they're implementing, which means that they're likely to implement it wrong. And yeah, you know, IP is scary for that. Um, so that's most of the new stuff that's coming up quickly. And uh, I guess I'm out of slides. So uh, what's kind of fun with this is cars are something that everyone deals with on a somewhat regular basis. If you don't own one, one might hit you. So it's kind of everyone's problem. Uh, so usually people can come up with some weird questions about cars. So I find it fun to just field questions about like, I don't know, CAN bus tools or automotive security or just cars in general. Or if you want to hack your own car, we can talk about that. But uh, I'm not quite sure about time, but we can go to questions. Anything in this presentation, github.com slash linklayer is my uh, kind of company for running all the CAN bus stuff. You'll find all the firmware, hardware for that on that GitHub. Cantac.io is just a website for this thing. And I'm that on Twitter at Eric Evanchik, or you can email me at a just rearrange the symbols and put a dot com at the end. Uh, but yeah, uh, time wise, I'm not sure, but let's have some questions. Over here. Thank you. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, oh. oh. Which are all the way to connect uh, to the canvas? All the ways to connect to the canvas. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm going to generalize that question into what are the attack surfaces on a vehicle. <laughs> um, so the, mo the obvious one is this OBD connector, because when you sit in the driver's seat, it's like staring you in the face. It's just asking to be plugged into. But let's start from the outside. You obviously have cellular systems. So with a cellular system, you might be able to find an exploit on that and get access to a controller that is on a CAN bus. So you didn't directly access the CAN bus, but now you can send CAN frames. So it's sort of the same thing. Uh, more local systems, you have things like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, even the tire pressuring monitoring systems in your tires. They're wireless, and they're connected to CAN. And there actually was a vulnerability in one of them that let you craft CAN frames. Um, so yeah, lots of wireless. Then if you want to get physical access, uh, if you're outside of the car, so if you're not a trusted user in the sense that you're not inside, 
Um, there have been known attacks on vehicles that involve things like uh, breaking a hole in a tail light and accessing a wiring harness behind that tail light. Um, you know, pretty uh, simple if you know where it is. You just punch a hole and clip onto these wires. You can use uh, what are called T-taps to do this really easily. These are little uh, piercing, the, the little uh, pieces of plastic with metal in them. And you screw the thing down and it pierces through the insulation of the wire and connects to the inside. But you can take it off and no one would really know that you did it. It just makes like this little tiny hole. So you can use something like that to actually connect pretty s stealth. Uh, then, of course, you have any controller. You can actually unplug like an engine controller and plug in your own thing instead. And uh, diagnostics. I mean, I mentioned OBD, but other vehicles have different diagnostic ports. Uh, older vehicles have different stuff. But also, for example, the uh, GM, the Volt, it has an OBD port where it's supposed to be. And then it has another OBD port over on the other side with more CAN buses on it because they wanted access. So lots of places. The weirdest one I've seen recently was actually in Stefano's car on the way over here. Uh, <laughs> he has a, an issue with his, his trunk where the like cover on one of the arms for the trunk like comes down. And there's a wiring harness that goes up there. And there's two wires twisted together. And that almost always means it's a CAN bus. So yeah, you just have to open his trunk and you'll get, you'll get a CAN bus. <laughs> <coughs> what about uh, the infotainment as an attacki attacking vector? I had uh, in my own hand the source code of the infotainment of the Mini, and it was a 4 million mass spaghetti code we based on a very old uh, Linux uh, installation without any kind of patch. And of course, the infotainment is connecting to the canvas, so I think from here you can reach everywhere. Do you confirm it? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, the infotainment system is one of the larger concentrations of code, I'd say. And part of that is because, like, yeah, it's a Linux kernel or a QNIX kernel, probably. And there's just a lot of stuff. Um, if you want to have a good time on a lot of vehicles, you can go into, like, settings and then really deep in the menu, there will be an option to see the license agreements. And if you scroll, like, I've had a, it was a Chrysler vehicle, I think, and you literally could scroll through this list on the little radio head unit, like, you know, maybe 50 characters per line and, like, four lines per page, and go through, like, the GPL like that. But in some cases, that'll actually tell you exactly what version of software is running on it. And if it's something like... I don't know, a vulnerable version of libpng that there's known CVEs for, you can just go back and Google that and maybe find an exploit. The other problem with infotainment, so the other place you have concentration of code is in the new self-driving systems. But infotainment has this major issue of having a lot of connectivity. So, you know, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular, sure. Um, my favorite one from the uh, CAESS folks they had, a, they had an exploit where they could call the car. It had a built-in cell phone feature. And play a song. And in that song, they had figured out how to encode data. The reason this was uh, enabled is in areas where you don't have data coverage, you may have voice coverage. So this was a system that had the ability, if your vehicle was stolen, to turn the car off. So they could play a song through the telephone into the car and shut the car down. <laughs> which is the most movie-style hack I've ever seen, but it actually worked. Um, so yeah, like the attack surface is just hilariously large. Uh, SD cards. Uh, another favorite one was when the Jeep got hacked, they sent out USB sticks saying, you know, update the code using these USB sticks on, on these devices. Um, most firmware on automotive systems today, this is getting better, but today it's usually unsigned. Meaning, if for those USB sticks it was not signed, someone could just send a bunch of USB sticks out to people saying, oh, here's a patch for your car, and like, you know, change all the code on it. And then they have a system that can record audio, that can control certain parts of the CAN bus, that can connect back to a server. Uh, it's like such a great attack vector. It's, it's insane. And it's, you know, it's like the IoT. Uh, you see these devices, and they're limited, of course, in their resources. They're limited in the time to development. Often updating them is expensive and hard. And 
they release something and it just doesn't work out and there's known problems and if you're lucky you have a way to update it but a lot of people don't so that's another thing that's changing is over the air updates are becoming a thing which is good um because you know before tesla did it it really just wasn't a thing like every car when they sold it to you unless you took it back to the dealership that car was like just static the code never changed so that also helps for patching but uh, I guess that's my rant about infotainment systems, but you're definitely right. They're like one of the coolest parts in terms of especially traditional security because it's, it's Linux. Any vulnerabilities you see on any other Linux systems, probably going to exist there too. Cool. Thank you.